Well, hello everyone and welcome to what is the 156th edition of DF Direct Weekly, our weekly discussion show covering the latest gaming and technology news. Uh, wow, we've got a huge amount to get through this week, so let's quickly do the intros. Hi, Oliver McKenzie. Hey, Richard Ledbetter. It's always fun. <laughs> always fun to be on. I think this is a very Phil-centric episode, so yeah, it's going to be absolutely. fun to talk Xbox with you too. And of course, John Linneman top of the morning to you gents i'm ready to fill our bags with uh, xbox news <laughs> with you're ready to fill your bags with phil related you got produce. it juice okay it. yes um phil spencer has done an interview with polygon and there's so many news stories that are derived from that interview with polygon so let's get straight to it okay so let's talk about i think what must be the biggest news topic of the week which is uh megaton news possibly even gigaton <laughs> Uh, disclosures from Phil Spencer in Polygon, where he's talking about various topics, uh, including handheld Xboxes, which we should be talking about shortly, but possibly the, the most seismic of statements, um, basically talking about adding third party stores like the Epic Game Store and whatnot, maybe even Steam to Xbox. And wow, that basically upends the entire conception, the entire economy of how a, a console platform operates right now. Potentially huge stuff then. Um, John, what's your take on this? Uh, well, honestly, I, hearing Phil talk about this sort of concept kind of ties into what I've been trying to say on recent directs regarding the potential shifting of Xbox to a completely different style of hardware slash software combination. Yep. You know, the idea of like basically taking the Steam Deck style approach to it, where it's like run a game version of Windows, kind of like Steam OS is for Linux, uh, but open up the platform in a way that we've never seen before in a console, uh, save for the Linux stuff on PS3, which was not really that comparable i would say uh so basically it seems like there's potential here for turning the xbox into what microsoft originally wanted to, the xbox to be which is a pc in the living room um and this is something that traditionally didn't make sense didn't seem to work just i don't think it was a something that would have made sense at the mass market level but i think the steam deck and its success and the way valve has approached it really has sort of uh, it's shown a light on what's possible now with PC games and sort of uh, creating profiles and optimizing games for one or two target hardware platforms and making that actually work uh, on a large scale. The difference here, though, is that they're talking about things like Epic Games and other other storefronts that they don't run. Uh, which is the difference between, you know, Steam Deck obviously runs Steam OS and it runs Steam. So Valve does have cert a certain level of uh, customization options available for how they approach this. Uh, it could be a little bit tricky if they're using third party stores in the Xbox sense. And I really wonder what it means because there's no way they could just say, oh, yeah, all PC games work on your Xbox. Because realistically, that would result in a bad experience for the consumer for games that perhaps don't run properly, both older games, which have compatibility issues, or newer games, which perhaps are released post this hardware launch and are too powerful for the machine to run well, which obviously we see on the Steam Deck right now with some of the big new releases. But... We don't have the full picture yet, right? Obviously. Phil's hinting at some potential for where they want to go, but... There's a lot of questions we still have. I will just say, I think from Microsoft's perspective, let's face it, they have they they are not able to compete in the traditional console model at the moment. Uh, ever since Xbox One, basically, they've tried. They've done some good stuff since then. They did try to s basically fix some of the major faults with the Xbox One, but they never really pulled it off. I would argue, even though they've had a, they've had a good run of it. And I think that by shifting gears to this new sort of model, they're taking a path that, as I've said before, Sony and Microsoft cannot, sorry, Sony and Nintendo cannot actually follow because right. they, they are not in command of such something like Windows as Microsoft is, right? They can't do like a custom PC style thing. They are basically stuck in the closed ecosystem uh, traditional console model. 
So it's it's an interesting thing that micro, only Microsoft can really accomplish out of the current big three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oliver? Yeah, if this is what it looks like on the surface, and it basically just means other platforms releasing their entire catalogs or something, you know, a very comprehensive number of their older titles on Series X, I think it's a very com compelling idea personally. Um, obviously, you know, the Series X, Series S could run a stripped back version of Windows and could run these titles, right? Um, but I, I kind of think it's more of an appealing thing for older games because for newer games, you usually do have a dedicated Series X or Series S version that you can run just fine. And that's a better tuned version. Typically, I'd have to imagine than a PC version that's dealing with like a split memory pool thing and it's not going to be ideal, right, in that sense. So I think that's very compelling. And also, I don't know what the legal logistics of this would be, but it seems like potentially a very compelling way to just scrape up all those PlayStation PC exclusive titles. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> run Final Fantasy VII Remake or something on a Series X, it seems totally plausible, right? Um, but I think there are some issues. On the technical side, I think that the unified pool of memory on the Series X and Series S could pose some issues. I don't know if the system would automatically provision the CPU and GPU or if that would be under user control. Again, this is adding some complexity that you don't really like to see. Obviously, there's enormous technical hurdles that just have to do with having to support maybe a cursor input on some level. That gets complicated. Certainly on the Steam Deck, that is not as much of an issue, but in large part on the Steam Deck, that's because it has built-in uh, touchscreen and built-in trackpads, which allow you to overcome those issues when they do occur. Um, and then I, I think you're going to run into some issues with RAM provisioning. Even looking at some other 16 gigabyte devices with unified RAM setups like the Steam Deck, you do run into some issues in higher end titles. Again, wouldn't be as much of an issue for older games. But then of course you have the 10 gigabyte Series S, which seems like its own kettle of worms. So I would personally, the way that I would look at this is this is a great way to play older titles on your series consoles and not like the way that you'd want to play like Avatar Frontiers of Pandora necessarily. That's a much harder right. ask. But for older legacy titles, I think it could be a really compelling way to boost that library and give you a lot more choice than you currently have. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Oliver, that you say that, because in my mind, I was actually thinking of this more as them talking about future plans, not the Series X. Basically, like, I don't, I'm not convinced that this is feasible on Series X, and I'm not sure that's what they're talking about. Uh, I suspect this, when they talked about the biggest leap ever for next generation consoles, perhaps this is what Phil was talking about, was like a gigantic shift in their entire strategy. Uh, but I, I don't think that necessarily includes Series X. Although, obviously, I think they'll have to continue to support it. They can't just abandon it. But for next generation, you know, all bets are off. Where do I begin with this? Um, first of all, when Phil makes comments like this, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's not just sort of, you know, sitting about having a coffee and musing, you know, about potential stuff. You know, if he's putting this stuff out it's definitely firmly in contention for actually happening, right? I mean, this guy produces uh, comments which, you know, come to pass sometimes years ahead of when he made them. And I think that's one of the things that I respect about him because, you know, he's willing to, you know, actually engage and get the stuff out there, lay the groundwork. I suspect there's probably, I mean, at this point, Phil is like CEO of gaming, not just for Xbox, but for PC as well. So, you know, he's going to be thinking not just about the next couple of years, but, you know, anything up to the next 10 years, possibly even more than that. What does gaming with, within Microsoft look like at that point? And uh, bringing Xbox and PC together aligning them more closely just makes a lot more sense. What's surprising me is that he's talking about it right now because it does kind of suggest that, you know, you will see this happening in the next couple of years, which could possibly mean that the next console is being brought forward to 2026, as many people are suggesting, or it could mean that maybe there will be some movement on Xbox Series X. Because if we look at what is theoretically possible, um, with the Series S, it's just too resource constrained, particularly mm -hmm. in terms of memory, in order to be able to run PC games on it as is. Older titles, possibly, right? You know, from the days where you had, you know, two gigabyte, four gigabyte GPUs and four gigs of RAM, system RAM, possibly, you know, that would work. Series X is going to be a bit more of a challenge because it's got 16 gigs, which is kind of enough to do... Uh, a lot of games 
Um, but when you start divvying up that 16 gigs into video RAM and system RAM, which is the way PC works, things get a bit more complicated. And I think, Oliver, you alluded to the fact that, you know, 16 gig handheld systems are starting to reach, uh, they're starting to have issues. Like Alan Wake, mm -hmm. for example, uh, requires you to jump through hoops to get it running even on a ROG Ally. Um, and then again, there's right. also the um, this, the Series X has that fast pool of memory and the slow pool of memory. So how would that translate into the PC space? Um, so the timing of it makes me think maybe something would be happening, you know, the, in terms of the timing of the statement. Maybe something is happening with Series X because, you know, why why talk about this now? You know, if hardware is two years away, three years away, four years away. Um, Series X could possibly do it. You know, the, the wizards in terms of compatibility at Xbox are not to be underestimated. True. Um, in terms of what would actually be required, it would just be, you know, a more generalized driver, I guess, because it's already an, a Windows-based system. Um, it, but it would need, um, I think, primarily a video-based driver. It would need to be running Windows, I think, uh, a more generalized version of Windows to cope with some of the more esoteric stuff like um, uh, anti-cheat technologies, for example, something that, that Steam Deck struggles with. So, you know, I think it's viable on Series X, not Series S. Um, but how yes. Would you how would you even communicate that to the players, though? Yes, yeah, it's, it's tricky, right? It would be a kind and of... Series X is the, thing. It's the lesser selling machine as well. So it's kind of like you know, cutting off most of the audience, which is still why I don't think it would apply to series. The consoles. other, the other uh, point potentially is that it's built into the design of whatever this handheld they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. handheld talk. I mean, we've got an entire news topic lined up about it later, that it could well be that this is where it starts, right? Um, that's where, you know, so, I, I suspect the handheld will arrive a lot sooner than the next gen console. One interesting thing is uh, when we last spoke with Phil, uh, we got into a debate about game preservation and ownership of games. And, you know, there's those are two separate things. Like, he knows that I love physical media, and that's more like an ownership thing uh, versus actual preservation, I would say, yes. by and large. And we ultimately came to the agreement, and he's right on this, that, you know, the real preservation happens on the PC, especially yeah. with uh, DRM-free stuff, you know, but... Yeah, that's a, that gets a little bit tricky, but that's where preservation happens. It's the PC. It's not these closed platforms. And, you know, based on that conversation and like the stuff he's saying now, I really, it really does become clear that he's thinking about this in a very different way from the traditional console model of having everything locked down. And if this is indeed the future that they're going towards, I can also understand why they are suddenly sort of shifting away from even bothering with discs at all. Uh, right. Which, you know, it's I kind of accepted that that's just where Xbox is and that's what Xbox is going to do. I can see why they would want to get out of that market. That's they're not selling a lot of discs as far as I know. Uh and the audience has mostly shifted over to either digital purchases or Game Pass, right? It's, it's so, difficult to buy the discs at this point. For Xbox, yes, yeah. especially like the Xbox sections, retail sections have largely been decreasing. Like even in Germany, where there's still a lot of physical media out there, like Xbox sections are have become tiny and outdated. Like they're just not really selling much for it. Um, which I always thought was a little bit odd. And they kind of handicapped themselves the fact that one Series S doesn't support discs, obviously, right? Um, yeah, and then also uh, just the fact that. Uh, you know, Game Pass is obviously a big deal, and all this. Other, there's a there's a lot of factors there that sort of makes it. Well, I can understand why it it would be shifting in this direction. Yeah, the the the, the shift in direction just does seem to be more like a kind of uh, Steam model, where exactly. it's, a, it's a storefront that runs on a lot of different systems, and they have a host system which they carefully curate. That kind of makes sense to me. I'm looking at this Polygon interview again, and there's something else here which. Uh, is surprising, which I think is a seismic change in the way that the economies of the console market work, which is, at the moment, the point is that um, console hardware is sold at a loss, and then the uh, the cost is, um, is is kind of clawed back via, you know, game purchases, subscriptions, that kind of thing. Oh, of course, the cut that the uh, platform holder takes from all of the third parties for hosting those games. 
typically the reason why this happens is that you get a low cost piece of hardware out there and then um you know the mainstream buyer is is more attracted to that and buys into the console and therefore the ecosystem etc cetera, etc cetera. but phil seems to be saying here that um this model isn't really working anymore he doesn't think it's not expanding the market and it sounds like he wants to do away with it and we have heard these rumors for a long time now that basically an Xbox could be a design of of PC that, you know, anybody can make if they fancy it, um, which I find quite interesting. I'm wondering if that's the way it's going to go and whether instead of having a subsidized model, Phil is looking at competition between um, Microsoft and third party vendors to produce their own Xboxes. Any thoughts yeah. on that, Oliver? I think in an era of cross platform gaming and very homogenized PC hardware, it makes a lot of sense because the consoles aren't really differentiating themselves on a hardware level and on a software level, they don't really either for the most part. So I think that they could offer a lot of potential hardware configurations to address like very large segments of the market. Now, in terms of subsidizing those configurations, you're gonna have a lot of trouble if you're not controlling and getting a decent cut from those stores, right? Which is another point of contention. Mm. But I think that, you know, with the Xbox UI as kind of a front end for running Windows software and some work, making sure that those games run with a good graphics configuration, at least by default on Xbox systems, sort of like we see now with the Steam Deck, I think that would be really compelling. Um, I think the hardware maybe poses a bit of an issue there uh, in terms of defining minimum specifications. Like, do you yeah. say, oh, here's the minimum spec for four years, and then we're moving up the minimum spec in terms of hardware? Because presumably you have new hardware releases happening very frequently with this model, right? Um, and then in terms of the platform thing, I kind of think that the end of Xbox as an exclusive console platform is probably already written <laughs> as far as this is, uh, right. is concerned. So is that a bad thing, good thing or bad thing? I, I think in this case, it's probably a good thing, but I'm not too agitated about that. Like if you assume that Microsoft takes a really aggressive multi-platform stance in the years to come and, you know, Windows is being treated like kind of a second class citizen at the moment, I think it makes a lot of sense to consolidate your efforts behind the potentially much larger group of Windows PCs that could be developing the software, could be running the software, and try to organize the Xbox around that and sort of more like the original Xbox pitch was organized, right? The direct Xbox. Um, I think that would be yeah. really interesting and really compelling potentially. And, you know, the only thing that's really keeping Windows gaming from being a really good fit for the living room, in my opinion, is a lack of a really good console-centric interface to launch games and to play games from. I think that's the main issue. And if Microsoft can overcome that, which I, I have every belief that they can, um, then they could have a really compelling uh, product category, <laughs> I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a case of how those third party stores are going to be implemented. Is it going to be just like a compatibility layer with standard Windows? Uh, I'm not sure that would work. I think if you look at the Steam Deck and the way that the, you know, the whole Steam client has been integrated into the hardware, it's going to be down to the likes of Steam and Epic to produce client stores like that that actually work, even if the games that are actually being booted are essentially PC games. But um, I find this whole thing really quite interesting. And the concept that Xbox is basically moving away from what we consider to be the archetypal uh, console model. You look at Steam Deck and it, it's, you know, you can't argue that it's not a console. It is and it works. Um, and it's the one mm -hmm. thing I guess it's lacking is the third party integrations there because you can do it, but you have to go through a you know, it has to be Linux compatible. You have to go to the Linux desktop to do it. So Microsoft seems to be taking this one step further. And I guess, you know, looking at the PC space, um, you can have a situation where there's like a first party of sorts producing hardware and then third parties producing their variants because you see it with like PC graphics cards. Um, you see it with, um, I suspect, you know, if Microsoft are going to be doing it, they would have their own third part uh, sorry first party handheld but i suspect it would have much in common with say the you know whatever a next generation rog ally looks like and you know as long as you can get an xbox client on there and it and it hits the hardware specification that microsoft is uh, going to be going for there's no reason why you couldn't install Xbox on there and get an Xbox experience. This is, I think, the greatest strength of Microsoft in this scenario is that not only do, are they obviously in control of Xbox, but they are steering 
the path of PC gaming via Windows. Mm -hmm. So why not bring all of that stuff closer together? The ramifications in, you know, the, the, the sort of headlines in the short term won't be particularly flattering to Microsoft in some respects because we are looking at the end of the traditional console model for Xbox. But, you know, if Xbox becomes something similar to Steam, I'm, I'm not against that more games running on the system. The other thing, of course, is, you know, the concept that you would just get instant access to basically the entirety of the legacy PC library, which I, th I think would be pretty amazing, right? Yeah, right. 100%. If if it's indeed possible, I think that would be a super cool thing to do. I'm, I'm just seeing this as like two layers. You have your um, Xbox gaming operating system, the, the Xbox yeah, yeah, yeah. possibly, and then, you know, it can just uh, move out onto a more generalized PC platform that you probably wouldn't get maximum performance from it, but it would still be pretty impressive, right? You know so, what? Thinking about this also, like, I, I don't know how far they would actually go, but like... Uh, you know, with the dev mode on, on Xbox, like on Series S, for instance, I had a great time with Audi just going through um, DOSBox Pure on there, where we were just loading up lots of random prepackaged DOS games that all just run and start on the Xbox, and they even have an interface to handle all the mouse and keyboard stuff, and it worked. It was super cool, and if Microsoft, like, imagine that with this more open platform, store vendors could set something up like that. Like, what if GOG was allowed to get involved, for instance, uh, and you could start putting out all these classic PC games that have been somewhat customized to work on that system. I think that's super compelling, and it's it's something unique that uh, would allow them to embrace both modern and retro gaming. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts on this, Oliver? No, I just think it's a really interesting idea, and I think if you look at kind of the tapestry of what we're looking at now in the news, like with Chris Dring from GamesIndustry.biz reporting that you know, people are not so enthusiastic about Xbox and the development side of things with respect to their market share and maybe people are canceling projects. It does make a lot of sense for Microsoft to say, hey, we, we actually can't really survive in the conventional console market. And maybe the existing console business works pretty well for Sony. Certainly they've had their issues as of late, but it seems to be working okay for them. It's not working yeah. comparably well for Microsoft and obviously they need to change something. Sorry, there's just a question here of survival and um, strategy. I think, you know, they probably could survive on the existing model, but the point that Phil continually makes is that he wants to, you know, basically widen the total addressable audience and it can't be done with the existing console model. Uh, so I think that's part and parcel of what's going on here. Okay, so we've got some supporter questions on this. Let's take this one first of all from Lavanda Davis with uh, reports of Microsoft allowing third-party stores on Xbox. I think that quote-unquote walled garden storefronts are coming to an end. Apple has been in legal trouble twice for such practices and eventually all devices will have to accept alternative storefronts. What are the chances that Sony and uh, Nintendo will voluntarily open up or will governmental oh. forces do it for them? Um, this could be another element of Phil's strategy here, which is to say, hey, this stuff is happening and we don't really want to be caught up in it. How do we, you know, preemptively get away from that and how do we make it work best for Xbox? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thought there. I mean, um, Tim Sweeney's arguments um, have been primarily against Apple and um, Google and not really against the console manufacturers because his argument is that the subsidized model um you know makes it less monopolistic in some way yeah it only it's, he's only having that attitude because the consoles don't affect him <laughs> there's been a lot of um i have some issues with some of the the battles that tim has been fighting under the the guise of trying to be like the good guy but i don't think that's true well he has been with fortnite he's been able to dictate terms to a certain extent with um the platform yeah, holders exactly so maybe, maybe that's why there's less beef there but you know i can i can well see the eu not taking the same view that, <laughs> that you know the, the consoles and um uh, you know, a, a, a different in some way than a smartphone. So I do think there is probably an element but, of strategy. Uh, I don't know, though. When you think about this opening up, that really creates so many problems for these machines because you can't really just have easily have an open storefront on such different architecture. Like, look at the, something like the Switch, right? Yeah. What are you be... going to do there? Like, just have a bunch of... It's like, oh, yeah, now you can run... What are you going to run? Windows? Like, I, it just... 
Are no, people going to make stores for opening it? Opening like, up the platform doesn't change the nature of the platform, that whoever uh, wants to enter that market would have to compete with Switch I've, games. The problem, man, see... Mm, that's that's that, it. That just creates... <laughs> No, I, I'm just worried that this, to some degree, creates the problem that a Nintendo originally solved back in the 80s, the thing that sunk Atari and all that, where they just the platform was wide open, anybody could put any junk on there, and the Switch is already dangerously close to that, even with these restrictions in place. Wow. Like, the eShop sucks. There's so much garbage on there. <laughs> and, like, imagine if the floodgates to that open further, and anyone could put anything on there. Like, you're going to be drowning in just, like, complete, like, digital bile. There will be, like impossible to find anything <laughs> even remotely good on that system uh that's well, like that's the big risk i see uh nobody's forcing you to install a third-party storefront uh, i know but it's just i, I we'll, we'll see how that goes it just i'm still okay. skeptical that that's a great idea for if a machine stays in the traditional model i don't think that's a great idea what microsoft's proposing is more like this is this is this runs PC games rather than like here's an alternative store. Well, I think a, sort. another element of this that's very important is if you look at what the EU is doing and when you look at what the United States is trying to do in their various antitrust cases. I think that this is the direction of travel for the industry, but I also think that Microsoft is in a position where they can say, "Hey, you know, we have a box that could run Windows, and we could get all these games on it, and we could actually have a business model that's compatible with the idea of operating multiple third-party storefronts and trying to get a bigger chunk out of the hardware or trying to get a chunk from those storefronts." Right? They have a business model that's sort of more compatible with that idea, and if they say, "Hey, listen, you know, EU, America, whatever." We've shown we ha can have a console model with this open uh, architecture, and our competitors aren't, so you better force them to do so. It could put Microsoft, or rather, could put Nintendo and Sony in a more challenging position than it would put Microsoft. I also think that's potentially an, an element of what's going on here. Yeah, fair enough. For this uh, question from Big Man Upstairs. A good morning, gentlemen. Uh, regarding Sp Phil Spencer's hints at the possibility of integrating Steam with Xbox, I think it's more third-party stores, but possibly Steam, right? It wasn't even mentioned by name in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, do you think this would make Sony more hesitant to release their games on Steam, especially if it means those games could be <laughs> playable on Xbox on the same day they're released? Alternatively, might Sony consider launching their own platform on PC, limiting PS5 games to their exclusive store fund? Adding Steam to Xbox would be a significant win for Xbox. However, how open do you think Sony would be to allowing such a development? Uh, uh, well, you know, ultimately, you know, if they want to sell PC games, they've got to be on Steam, right? Yeah, I, I don't think that would dissuade Sony from jumping on Steam further. They've I mean, already they, got like a year to two years. Yeah, they already have that gap. And if they can sell more copies, so be it, right? It's not, I don't think it's a problem for them. I mean conversely there's been all the talk about xbox putting stuff on playstation right yeah and if this kind of happened the reverse way through this sort of method you know i, I think it is what it is and i think sony would just accept those sales <laughs> yeah right. but there's also the possibility that sony just has contracts or could have contracts in the future that would just preclude this software being offered on an xbox console right uh Mm, I think well, I don't that would know, be really tricky to enforce. If, if it's it, an open storefront, how do you enforce that? Yeah, it screams anti-competitive behavior. Exactly. Really. <laughs> yeah, Especially if you, Microsoft has their games on, on PlayStation, you know, it, it, cr it creates an even stronger argument for not allowing that. So I, I don't yeah, think Sony I mean, would win that. The EU in particular has been quite sort of um, aggressive in uh, sort of making these things more open. I honestly think that Microsoft could possibly be a target for this and they want to get ahead of it. And it would basically produce like a fickle down effect that would apply to everybody else at some point, I think. I don't think, you know, ultimately it would affect Sony too much. Um, we just have to wait and see. We still don't really know what form this is all going to take. Another thing that's interesting is that uh, if Microsoft essentially changes like str hardware strategy and like it's more open I, I was thinking of how like you know with the new switch coming out there's still going to be that desire to target a somewhat lower spec piece of hardware so um i, I feel like that will continue to influence games going forward perhaps yeah and if sony's the only one playing in the uh the big new console space and the traditional model that makes it harder to justify support for them perhaps i don't know 
Mm-hmm. I just there's a there's a lot of stuff to think about with this. I I haven't fully formulated all of my thoughts yet, but it is it is interesting because this would mark a big change in the console business. I think in summary, we've just had like initial hints from Phil about this, the mm-hmm. actual deployment of the strategy, when it's going to happen, what form it's going to take. That's going to be quite an interesting thing to watch unfold, but we just don't really have the insight from that because we don't really have any further details right now. But certainly it's uh, quite seismic stuff, just the implications and how that's going to affect the next generation Xbox is is going to be interesting because that one, you would think, would be designed around this strategy. Anyway, interesting stuff. But um, with that, I think we can uh, move on to the next news topic. And it's Phil again. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, the Polygon interview um, also included details of, well, is it details or is it more hinting from Phil about what he sees a handheld Xbox looking like? Um, Oliver, thoughts? To me, reading through this interview, it sounds like there are two proposals here or uh, two proposals that overlap quite a lot. It sounds like he wants to release a dedicated Xbox handheld of some kind and also a better front end for PC handhelds. And that dedicated Xbox handheld could be running similar software configuration or maybe a more classic console platform or somewhere in between, right? That's sort of my read on it. Um, and I think if you go from our you know, discussion earlier, uh, when it comes to game availability, if it had that ability to run Windows software, that would be very compelling as well. Um, I, I think it's a really cool idea. I've always loved the idea of a more premium handheld console. Obviously, Nintendo has shown that you can do a really nice semi-premium console, but if you had that a little bit aimed at the higher end, able to play more traditional console software, that would be really compelling, I think, higher end software. And the PSP model? PSP model. Vita model. Vita model, yeah. Um, I mean... (laughs) And I think that he has a good sense of where the limitations of the current Windows handhelds are. Because if you look at a device like the ROG Ally, I think the hardware is quite good, but obviously the software experience is not so good. It's kind of an, a mishmash of like oh, yeah. overlays with traditional windows, really small interface elements, a small touch screen display, and touch screens and windows don't mix that well that nowadays. And you have to like m- move the cursor with the thumbstick. And when you compare that to what Nintendo, or rather what Valve has done with the Steam Deck, there's definitely a sense that Valve like nailed all that stuff. Like you have a per- perfect front end interface combined with like great overlays, all kinds of toggles. It just works magically. It's so great. It's the perfect hybrid, I think, of a console platform and a PC platform. And then also you still have that left and right touchpad that can serve in for cursor support as needed because you do need that backup sometimes. So mm-hmm. I think that that's definitely a good way to go. And when you look at the current state of the PC and what could be adapted for a handheld, I think the current Steam big picture interface is very good, but that has its own limitations. It's basically a clone of the Steam Deck UI. Um, So something along those lines could be good if it was more comprehensive. And um, I think that's kind of the direction I'd like to see it go. But certainly this is one of those things that could go out in a million different directions. I'm just presuming, again, reading the tea leaves in this one, that, that he is referring to an experience that would translate onto these existing Windows handhelds and then something that could work for a dedicated Xbox device down the line as well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, John? Yeah, my thoughts are similar to Oliver and the stuff we've talked about in the past where basically embracing the Steam Deck model, which, you know, get an OS in there that, feels properly customized for playing games that feels like a real console like experience while still allowing sort of an open-ended back end to this to the system itself um and i also think this so i did mention psp and vita but i guess the issue with those was that it was the old style model where resources were split between handheld and console and obviously they couldn't the PSP was well supported, but not the Vita. And I don't think Sony could actually do both at the same time. Nintendo obviously shifted to a single model. I would be curious if Xbox, and I'm not sure they would do it necessarily, but if the handheld became like the Xbox platform, <laughs> uh, that would kind of create a different, or at least if, if everything that was released for Xbox had to run on that handheld, then yeah. that kind of creates uh, an, another Nintendo like situation. And so now you have two makers creating these handhelds where all the games need to target these handhelds, which kind of 
changes the scope of what developers can do to some degree, which given the, the amount of issues with like budgets spinning out of control and, and just development resources, maybe that's not so bad if it takes things back a little bit. So I feel like a lot of stuff has been learned that you can still do a lot with fewer resources and maybe do it more efficiently. I don't know. It, 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 it changes the market a little bit too. If, if two of the players are all in on these handheld devices, and I'm curious what that would mean for PlayStation as well. Mm. Um, well, I'm looking at the uh, interview with Polygon here, and Phil's got a sort of laundry list of stuff that he'd <laughs> like to uh, to happen on a handheld. And it's basically that, well, it really does sound as though he wants the Xbox ecosystem to be fully transferable over in the same way that it is between, say, Xbox One and Xbox Series consoles, right? You can start a game on Xbox One, and you can finish it on Xbox Series with, you know, improved performance and whatnot, but fundamentally your saves are going to work and um, you've got that continuity between the uh, the whole ecosystem over the whole platform. And, you know, he's talking about scenarios here, like, you know, he can play Fallout 76 on his handheld PC. He's got, seems to have a Legion Go at the moment, uh, which is there. I've got one too. Um, but yeah, it, it's not basically doing the job in terms of... Um, fully plumbing into the Xbox ecosystem. So I think it would need a proper Xbox client and it would need to run the Xbox versions of the game, therefore, which kind of brings us back to the thing that you've been talking about probably for months now, John, which is the concept yep. of the Xbox VM working on a PC. And, yeah. you know, that, that would kind of do the job. Monkey but paw moment, though. They bring back games for Windows Gold, <laughs> games for Windows Live, I guess it is. That's the interface. Or, or UWP. Uh, oh no! Because <laughs> they've tried it, right? You know, UWP. You could play the same games on an Xbox. You could play them on a tablet. You could play them on a PC. This is, oh man, this has fundamentally been the Microsoft problem for as long as we can remember. Right? They have tried to integrate games in the Windows so many times, and it never works. It never freaking works, dude. Like it's just it. The games for Windows Live stuff, of course, the way they tried to do it in Vista, and then they tried again, you know, they've tried all these different approaches, and it, it it's always this weird half step that's annoying to use, doesn't really offer the real flexibility you're looking for. I mean, the UDWP stuff went or early on, especially, it was like an absolute just joke. And even now, like, I still think the Xbox storefront on PC isn't isn't a very good app. It has issues. And sometimes it's like, it'll just do something, and you're not sure why, and then fixing it requires jumping through an insane number of hoops in a way that's just like, wow, I can't believe this is still a thing. So, so to, maybe to, an Xbox VM solves that problem. They need, yeah, they've got to get it right. They've got to get that right. If they want this to work, they really need to put that that. R&D effort into making sure that they finally truly nail this in a way that they've never done it before. I think there's an advantage that they've got in the handheld space, which is that it's all AMD at the moment, effectively. We've got oh. the MSI Claw, which uses Intel, but it's not going to do great. That's so good. <laughs> That's so good. But, you know, basically everything else is either a Ryzen 7 7840U or the equivalent Z1 Extreme. You know, if you're talking about Rog Ally, Legion Go, a whole host of those Chinese handhelds, some of which are really, really good. So, you know, it's basically as close as you're going to get to a fixed platform. <laughs> so, you know, that is fertile ground, I think, for having like an Xbox v uh, VM running on a PC piece of hardware. It would work in the handheld space. And then maybe when you've got your next generation console, you know, you set a new spec point. I mean, there's some good stuff that AMD are doing with their APUs, you know, the, the potential of the new Strix Point APU, you know, it's, it's, it's got a ton of compute power in it. It could do really, really well. I don't know. Um, but in the handheld space, I think they've they've got the opportunity there and I think they need to do something about it and they need to do something about it sooner rather than later because we've gone now through... Uh, we've got Steam Deck, which is, you know, basically one platform, but we've already had two iterations of it. And as you know, John, the, that second iteration of the Steam Deck is scarily good yeah. if you're Microsoft. It's so good, <laughs> dude. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the concept of actually um, getting involved sooner rather than later makes a lot of sense because where is Microsoft going to be 
um, if they continue not to do something, you know, Valve could be on Steam Deck 2 or Steam Deck 3 or, you know, even Steam Deck 4 by the time, you know, something happens on the, on the Xbox side. And Steam it's a, Deck 360. <laughs> it, it would be a, an opportunity missed. But that seems to be what Phil's talking about in this interview, that he seems to want to bring Xbox to handhelds in a way that doesn't sound much like the PC client, because... Um, Although Play Anywhere is a thing, it's it's not the Xbox experience really that, no, that you really, really want because Play Anywhere, the concept of Play Anywhere, of course, being that you can port your progress across uh, from Xbox to PC and back again and different PCs, obviously, but it's it's not being widely supported, and obviously it's just bit bakes into the system on on the um, on the Xbox side of things, just kind of makes a a bit more sense there. Uh, I guess the the other thing, of course, is just the timescales. And we've had this tease from Phil that it's going to be happening, or maybe it was Sarah Bond that said it actually in the the business update podcast that uh, we would be seeing um, news from Microsoft in the holiday period. So maybe we'll we'll find out then. But again, mm. I still think the future there is kind of what could possibly happen on Xbox consoles, which is. Front and center, you've got an Xbox app, but you would have the ability to run those third-party stores. Uh, anything to add to that, Oliver? Any thoughts? Yeah, I I actually think that there is some interesting stuff here with the timelines because if you go back to last September when we had that big leak of those Microsoft documents from the FTC trial, um, in May of 2022, in Exhibit uh, 1517, they describe the idea of a handheld in their little triangle of things that they're doing as yeah. not being in scope for first party, right? So if something's changed mm -hmm. in the last 22 months since then, there's every possibility that we won't be looking at custom silicon. That's my first thought, right? It could be something off the shelf in AMD's mm -hmm. portfolio instead. It could be something like the 7840U or the 8840U, which is very similar, or Z1 Extreme, which is the 7840U, um, or off the shelf next gen silicon in the same power budget. And that and that's, uh, maybe a little disappointing it would it would certainly suggest that there could be more commonality between the xbox handheld and pc handhelds that are running the same silicon and it could allow them to standardize like you say standardize around certain capabilities um but there would be some things that probably wouldn't be on the table like a super wide gpu or a 128 bit memory interface or things like that that you might expect would be interesting additions potentially for a handheld platform just spitballing there but but i think that the probability of it being truly custom silicon goes down a lot when you consider the the timelines here if this is going to be something that's released say in the next year and a half or so it seems like a pretty short <laughs> period right yeah absolutely um what if, what if guys what if it's NVIDIA? <laughs> what, what if those teases and rumors we've heard and they actually, they, they got NVIDIA silicon for uh, a new handheld and they blow even Nintendo out of the water. It's also using NVIDIA, but just saying. I think that would have to be done. There's, there's some, it's an interesting conceit. The issue being that, um, first of all, we need to know how good the Microsoft um, ARM recompiler is because, you know, it's not going to be running x86 if it's an NVIDIA chip. Right, that's that's True. pretty clear. Yeah. Um, but there are um, we've got this new Snapdragon. Is it the Snapdragon Elite SoC coming out, which is an ARM-based um, processor, but it is running Windows and it's doing it via you know what is effectively emulation. It's a bit more complicated than that. I mean, we just don't know the performance level of that. I mean, we saw a report this week where the Snapdragon was running Baldur's Gate at 1080p 30 which would be quite a remarkable thing to see. I think it's too early right now to, to talk about ARM, possibly. And if the FTC sort of documents are sort of indicative of where Microsoft was at a particular time point, it, it would still be early days for a native handheld. But I still think that when you're looking at the handhelds that are out now, there are so many that are basically running the same specification. It would be nuts not to use that as the basis to get something out sooner rather than later. Uh, I think that could work really well. Any any final points on this one? No. I guess not. <laughs> Let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so it's still Microsoft news, everyone. Sorry if that <laughs> bores you. But at this point, there is no fill component to it. 
this is oh. a leak and a kind of bizarre one nonetheless. Um, obviously, when there was the Microsoft FTC leak, there was the reveal, uh, albeit an unintended one, of the unreleased console. It was allegedly coming out holiday this year, the Adora be all digital Xbox Series X. And um, this was kind of like, there was a counterpoint to this, which was there was a rumor that there would be uh, a device arriving sooner, which effectively does the same thing, which would be based on the current Series X. And there is a leak of this machine now. It's a white, all digital Xbox Series X. I understand from sources that this is legit. Whether it makes it to a final shipping product, I don't know. But there it is. Those are the pictures. Oliver, what do you make of this one? Yeah, I I guess at this point, we don't know if this is the Xbox Oops All Digital (laughs) or if this is something to bridge the gap, uh, which I'm sure Rich will talk about. But at this point, I think I sort of almost maybe this is going to be controversial. I sort of almost like this better than the adorably all digital Xbox because really? well, okay. I, I like the existing Xbox series shell and I like the way that the series X stacks almost perfectly on top of it. And I like the way that it's laid out internally and I like the thermal design. I think it's a very sensible thermal design that will probably age well because it's using a lower pressure fan and dust buildup probably isn't as much of an issue as it would be with a blower fan. Um, which obviously, you know, probably the, the the revision would also use that kind of fan layout. But I think it's a it's a good layout. It's uh, tried and true, and it looks interesting. Um, and it is kind of a workable <laughs> console in terms of its dimensions. Whereas the okay. updated console, you know, it's a cylinder. It's like a Mac Pro, so it's not going to be easily stackable. It's going to be a bit of a pain in a home theater setup. But I don't love the appearance of the Brooklyn refre- Refresh console that was leaked. But I do think that the updated white console would look a lot cooler, personally. I think it looks a little bit drab as it is, but I think it would look a lot cooler with green power LEDs to remind you of the 360. I think that would be a really interesting choice. Um, I yeah. think that console with green highlights would at least be... Uh, visually compelling. I guess it's not as exciting as a full refresh console, but at the same time, it's uh, it's a design that clearly works, so I'm not that offended by it, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it could be like a limited edition for all we know. Uh, John, what do you think? I mean, it's just, it, it, it seems to exist. It's a thing. <laughs> I see zero purpose in it. It's just, it's like, here's a Series X, but worse, basically. Yeah. Like, what I... I I don't, I would not want or need this product. There's zero reason for me to own it. Uh, it would essentially mean a, a large chunk of games that I would use on there, both from backwards compatible and newer stuff, I couldn't use. I think we can <laughs> safely assume that this isn't a console for you, John. No, it's not a console for me at all. Do you think there's a console that would be appealing to other people? Uh, not really. Like, <laughs> yeah. the Series X isn't exactly moving units, is it? Like, to make this work, it's like, here's the Series X, but we also took away the disk drive, which some people, <laughs> others might still care about. Uh, what the heck would draw customers to this? If anything, I actually heard from a couple friends already that's like, well, I guess I have to go get a seri- a regular Series X now, uh, you know, before they're gone, just to, because it'll be the last chance to have that type of machine. But I mean... If if the Series X isn't moving, what is, what does this do for the brand that gets people excited again? That's the question I have. Like, there's nothing, but we don't know if there's something more to it. But based on this, it's just like this is the same thing, but what worse? Uh, the only way I could see it really moving the needle maybe is if the price was much much lower. Like, if this was like two ninety nine or something, then maybe actually it would move the needle if they could like just kill off the Series S and make this like the the new entry level. Right. I don't think I don't think that's what they're going to do, but if I they could do it's that financially I, viable. I don't think so either. Like it's just it's just like a it's just a random I don't know, it's a weird the thing is though is like in console lifespans we we've often seen consoles strip back features in later models. Mm. Uh Obviously, you know, two of the big ones, there's the, the Wii Mini, which was just a piece of garbage that took away yeah. the, it took the away GameCube. the decent video output options and it removed the, the Wi-Fi. There's the GameCube that removed the digital video out, which to be fair, I used it back in the day, but most people probably did not. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, some of the, the late model PS2s, like the very last model PS2 has more limited backwards compatibility due to the 
chip that they shifted to, and it's just generally not as good of a unit. Uh, there's the the late model Super NESs, uh, which can which can be great now if you mod in RGB, but they lacked RGB. Uh, there's the PSP Street, if you remember that thing, which was also a big old piece of junk. Or even the, the PSP Go, which is only good because it got jailbroken. And without yeah. that, it's also worthless. So, like, the this new Series X just looks like one of those, where it's just like, well, okay, here's a here's a different revision that sucks. <laughs> well... Well, we got this question from Ben Woods. Uh, thoughts on the all digital Series X not looking so adorable? And I think he's hit the nail on the head there because um, you know if you're going to do a console a, a console revision, right? It's an opportunity to actually do a refresh to make it new, interesting, cool, etc. Whereas the the strategy here seems to be uh, cost reduction. I understand the heat sink has been um, uh, changed uh, and. You know, there's not really much going on in terms of changing of the tooling, etc. It's it's an Xbox Series X, right? You know, just with <laughs> it's just white without a optical drive, and it is <laughs> difficult to market when you say, "Hey, check out this new console." Um, it's just like the one we've already got out, a different color, but actually functionally worse than the one. I mean, it's like oh, it's got it's got there. a. It's got an extra 500 gigs or something of storage space. Well, actually, that's that was the other thing, of course, which is that uh, the adorably all digital Series X would have two terabytes. You know, that, which that is nice, of- but hardly something where it's like get people excited that aren't already excited for Xbox. Yeah, but you know, the point is that having a new piece of hardware that looks different is um you know a way you can market it. You know, mm-hmm. it gives it a bit more of a, a bit more oomph, so to speak. Whereas I, I'm not seeing any evidence here that we're actually looking at what could have been the adorably all digital uh, nah. Series X because there's no real hints apart from possibly the heatsink that we're actually changing the silicon. Uh, from what I understand, it may still be a seven nanometer chip. So it, you know, it may well be the case that the refresh is still coming, and this is some bizarre limited That's edition. True. That's true. It could be, you know, they've all, they've also they've also got that subscriber model, right, where you can actually subscribe and get the console and Game Pass Ultimate. Maybe it's designed for that. We don't have any context no, as to no, what no. this machine is actually about. Exactly. Um, and surely they, Microsoft must be aware that putting out a white version of the Series X that doesn't have a disk drive is, isn't a way to you know, reignite interest in Xbox. So I'm wondering what, what this actually is and what it's intended for. The, the other problem, Rich, I see is like, Based on timetables, this is looking to be the kind of thing it would release in a similar time frame as the PS5 Pro and then the new Switch, and which would be new, different hardware. And so if all three have new hardware arriving and the Xbox, which is selling worse than the other machines right now, only has like a slight cosmetic difference, yeah. what makes that even slightly compelling to the average person? Well, that's something I don't think even the adorably all digital version would would solve. No, it wouldn't. It's just like it's It's like fundamentally not exciting. No, as a concept, that's part of the problem on the Xbox hardware side of things. Um, I guess maybe it is the case that you know if they are bringing ahead their new console to twenty twenty six, you know, it's they're basically taking the hit now in favor of getting you know a head start on the next generation. But even so. yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. It's just uh, all a bit baffling, really, isn't it? One thing I do want to say about the 2026 sort of theory, there's not really been much to substantiate it beyond talk on Twitter. Um, and the mm. concept of actually shortening your timeline on developing a new console by two years is staggering, right? It, it yeah. takes a long time to make a console. You yeah, don't just yeah. rustle up something out of the blue. Um, so, yeah. I just don't know what to make of this. It doesn't appeal to me at all, really. Uh, changing the color and removing the drive is... <laughs> I can only think that it is some sort of promotional thing, perhaps related to a specific deal they're doing. The Digital One S? Yeah, they, they, obviously that happened, of, of course, and it didn't it fail to shift the needle at all. In fact, it was met with derision, really. I think it, so. Yeah, I think it is a much more interesting console if there is a 6 nanometer shrink involved. Which certainly the revised heat sink would possibly suggest, although it's not not at all clear that that's the case. 
Yeah. And if this is a six nanometer device, now granted it would be about two years after Sony did a six nanometer device, but it would have lower power consumption, presumably, you know, some unit to unit variance there, but it would be a, a, a compelling console in that sense. But if you do have lower power consumption, then I guess the question would be, well, why don't you do an external redesign? <laughs> uh, so I, yeah. yeah, I just, the, the notion of like a reduced power draw being somehow an exciting feature doesn't, no, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's a value Ambitious, add, basically, yeah. and, yeah. and the, the, the whole idea is that it opens the door to a new form factor, which you're not getting here. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a bit baffling. We need context, I think, to understand this. It may not even come out at all, for all we know, but as yeah, I understand exactly. it, this is not like a 3D print or anything. It could just be that, you know, Microsoft are moving to the adorably or digital version, but, you know, I've got some inventory they need to shift. So they've come up with some <sighs> Rip off the band aid, baby. <laughs> I guess we'll have to see whether all of this comes to pass. Right now, though, it's certainly a bit bizarre. I think that's all we've really got to say about that. Uh, so let's move on to the next news topic. Okay, so a couple of weeks back, we did a sponsored video on Outcast, A New Beginning, which um, really interesting project this because uh, THQ Nordic came to us and said, have you got any concepts that you could you know, possibly produce some custom editorial around? And I didn't know much about the game, but John did, and he was quite excited about it. And um, I think the final video that we put up, you've got to check it out, right? Because this is a fascinating game that came out in 1999. And there's a story there, a through line that brings us up to an actual sequel that finally happened like 24, right. 25 yeah. years later. So do check out that video. But one thing which we didn't do because the nature of a sponsored video is that it's not a review, is that we didn't really review it. And um, John, do you want to take up the story there? I mean, let's talk sure, about sure, the sure. sponsored video first of all, because it's a great piece of work. Yeah, so the reason I was interested in this and what pleased me about them asking about it is they kind of wanted a DF retro style retrospective to some degree, which was perfect because I am a gigantic fan of the original Outcast. Uh, I've had a deep respect for that game. Uh, as you'll see in the video, they were doing some crazy stuff and pushing PC graphics and tech in a very different way from the rest of the industry at that point. And there's some very forward looking things in there. But then those guys tried to make the sequel, Outcast, uh, The Lost Plan. I can't remember the full name. It was the second Outcast for PlayStation 2. Right. But they basically ran out of money, uh, or at least the, the publisher kind of reduced their funding and they couldn't actually make it, so it got canceled. And what's wild is that the game we we did just get last month, or this month, I guess, is a game that... It's these same guys that had been trying to get this thing made for decades. They they went through so many hoops and they somehow managed to stick it out, get back together again and actually make it happen. And it's just it's a crazy story. And I think it's really cool that they actually did manage to make it happen because the game was a lot of fun. It's more it's it has a lot of similarities to the original game in terms of the structure, but they also pushed out the move set so that you know you're a dude with a jetpack now, uh, which is fun. And as a result, it ends up and the way they built the world is so it's so vertical and so interesting in a way that's different from your typical open world game, and you can get around it pretty quick. That it ends up feeling more like a uh, a two thousands era three D platform game with outcast trimmings in a weird way like just climbing to the top of the spire to visit that desert city it took me like 30 minutes to get up there and you could fall at any point which in it which added a, a feeling of risk so when you actually did make it to the top of that giant spire it really felt like you came a long way to reach that point which i thought was really engaging so the game is cool it's interesting there's a lot of story history behind it but unfortunately uh, it launched with some issues on consoles. And this is where we get into the console test, because for that video, I actually just used the PC version, which, uh, while it didn't run it well initially, before launch, they did patch it, and the performance went up, like, dramatically. Like, I was getting, like, 30 FPS in the villages on my PC, and that went up to over 100 frames per second uh, by the time the final version actually released. So, huge improvement there. Uh, but yeah, console versions. Uh, after that, we actually tr thought, hey, maybe we should talk about this on DF Direct. So we we prepared to do a segment last week 
yeah. problem is, is I was trying to measure the frame rate uh, on PS5, and I was like, Rich, like the results I'm getting here doesn't make sense. Like it's not tracking correctly. Yes. And obviously, we have a lot of experience with, oh no, this game is doing something weird. Uh, and I thought, okay, Rich, being the expert on this, I punted it over to you. And you're like, okay, I, I, I'll take a crack at this. I got this. And then within like, you know, <laughs> 30 minutes of loading it up you're like uh yeah that was this, some weird this is messed up <laughs> yeah i mean if okay so yeah the story there is that we were given the playstation 5 build right and um the quality mode basically just runs at 30 frames per second as you'd expect yep mostly consistent frame pacing occasional drop frames you know it's it's okay it's, it's fine you know, yeah not, fine not exemplary but it does the job performance mode basically on the PlayStation 5 is a bit of a tearing fest. And um, yeah, basically calculating frame times uh, with tearing is a bit more uh, challenging. But, you know, we've, we've dealt with like games going back to the Xbox 360 era that do that. You, but there were some really odd responses coming back here. Um, but we can talk about things in broad terms and we've got some what I would consider to be accurate numbers here. And it kind of highlights the issue with the PlayStation 5 version specifically, which is that, um, well, what can I say? Um, the screen tearing is obnoxious, I think, on the PlayStation yeah. 5 build. It's, it's kind of present on all sectors of the screen. Mm. And it seems to, you know, be sort of very present in the middle and the bottom, which is, you know, in the middle is kind of like where your eyes, eyes are. are typically resting, right? So that's really not good. <laughs> so the performance mode on PlayStation 5 has these issues with tearing and it's all very odd. It doesn't really make sense, but this is how it is. These are the clips that I got out, which do represent the game as I believe it presents. And it's, it's all very odd. However, it seems to me that when the tracking is working correctly and we're getting correct response uh, frame rates and frame times, it's under 48 frames per second. And John, you noticed that the game actually supports VRR. It has a bespoke 60 hertz VRR mode. And obviously the VRR window on PlayStation 5 in that scenario is basically 48 hertz to 60. Correct. So we've got a VRR mode here, which might possibly be causing issues for the performance mode without VRR, but tell me how the VRR mode presents to you. Yeah, so that's what's weird. is So on PlayStation 5, as I think you guys are aware, there is an option to toggle it for unsupported games, right? So it just works on whatever. But if you have that off, games can initialize VRR themselves, and Outcast is one of those games. Uh, but like many other games that do... Uh, enable VR on PlayStation 5. I feel like the developers perhaps didn't fundamentally understand something about the way it works or didn't consider all the implications of this because you would want to offer a 120 hertz output mode so you could do low frame rate compensation, which we know is possible and it does work. It's just that that's not what we get here. It's 60 hertz. But in this case, what happens is with VRR is anytime the frame rate is above 48, there is no tearing. It actually looks completely smooth and great, uh, but right. the frame rate drops below 48 a lot. And so what ends up happening is you get this ping pong effect where you've got like nonstop screen tearing appearing, followed by zero tearing and fluid performance. And the way it bounces back and forth between the two is extremely jarring and strange because you're just like, it's like you're dropping in and out of V-Sync, but with a 48 frames per second, like floor. So, you can kind of see what they were going for, but it doesn't really work. And I have to wonder if whatever they're doing to enable that at VRR mode and the way the tearing behaves there, if that is somehow related to the way it presents in the non VRR mode, which is in turn making it really difficult to track those tear lines. Mm, but even so, it just looks bad. It's bad. Oh, yeah. Um, on a non VRR but screen. To, one thing to be noted, though, in the email we talked about, uh, they did say that they they are still working on some kind of major performance boosting patch for this. Right. I don't okay. know when that'll hit, but they they do at least seem confident that it will get noticeably better. Uh, and to a degree, I can believe it because uh, prior to so there was I tried it on PS5 before one of the patches went live, and that version actually had broken frame pacing in the 30 FPS mode. It was okay. extremely bad. Uh, 
and I actually sent that along to them, like, hey, this is uh, this is not good. But there should be fixed, a way. Right? They fixed it, and yeah. it is lar- it, There are some hiccups and traversal stutters, but the 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 incorrect frame pacing that initially presented was like constant and really bad, and that is solved. So they are at least making strides in those areas, and I I would like to hope that they could figure out a way to get it because. I mean, fundamentally, they are. It's still a pretty small team, right? This is this yeah. is not a triple A game by any means. It's a small team trying to make something that's visually pretty ambitious for Unreal Engine Four. Yeah, I'd say it's really nice. I think. I think it's a beautiful game, so I can see why they would be struggling with it for that. But mm-hmm. I have some hope. But anyway, Rich, after we figured out the PlayStation version, you went ahead and bought it on xbox to yeah. check this version well the reason i bought it on xbox is that we actually recorded this segment for df direct weekly last week and um we needed some assets to back it up right and so you know i looked took a look at the playstation 5 code which you've got and thought this is this is just really really bizarre what's going on here how can i actually get workable performance data to go on the direct and so I thought, okay, well, look, let, maybe maybe the Xbox version will track correctly. So I bought the Xbox version and took a look at it. And if we look at Series X, actually, there are issues there. There are profound performance implications as there are on PlayStation 5, but it tracks almost perfectly. It looks fine. And it's typically what we would expect from an Xbox game or a console game more generally, which is that the tearing is kind of kept at the top of the screen. And it's not really as noticeable, but there are still some pretty, pretty bad frame rate drops. Um, but it looks sort of OK for the most part. The busiest scenes do drop pretty badly. Though, did you um? Not did you get a chance to try VRR on that? I'm actually curious no, about I that. Didn't. It should wonder- present OK, though, based on what we're seeing here just from VSync off. Uh, I'll have to test that because scene. I feel like that's that's kind of the key. And we saw this with Dragon's Dogma 2 that Oliver mentioned as well as on Xbox. At 120 hertz output, you get that LFC, which means that those lower frame yeah. rates actually do uh, present correctly and smoothly. So, mm-hmm. that could so work. yeah, Xbox kind of presented as I would imagine. Now, performance mode still has issues. It kind of reminds me of an old, um, you know, Xbox One X or PS4 Pro game where they yeah. just remove yeah. the frame rate yeah. and yeah. you have like ve- exactly. highly variable performance. Yep. Yep. So it's it's okay, but not great. Um, but VR probably would help there, assuming it's you know works as usual then we move on to xbox series s <laughs> which also has quality and performance modes the issue being that both of them run at 30 frames per second locked <laughs> or, or the- capped so i'm not entirely sure what's going on there so hopefully things will improve there i mean ultimately if you are running this game at 30 fps which you've kind of got to to have a consistent experience uh, it's all right you know it, it's okay um, mm-hmm. And it certainly looks the part, and I'm not sure it's being sold at, you know, actually, I think it is being sold at high end AAA prices. Like oh, $60. really? Oh. I think I paid like um, a fair amount of money for it. So, yeah. Mm. But um, I think the point is that hopefully there will be some. Uh, improvements coming. They've they've said oh, as yeah. such. We've already it's had improvements. sixty. It looks like sixty bucks. Yeah. It's a really interesting game. I do like your pitch though, John, which is, uh, hey, we got a jetpack. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's maybe that was what was missing from the PlayStation Two pitch back in the day. Yeah, that's a fun thing to to think about. It is. It's it's a weirdly fun and enjoyable game, and it also. I made this video when I was sick, recovering for that week with COVID. So I have this like weird, like fever, feverish memories of playing through this game. <laughs> and it was kind of like being, tra- I was locked in my room like, in quarantine during that whole period. So it was just like me and outcast for like a week. And it was, it was such a trippy experience. I ended up playing through the whole game. <laughs> it looks good, <laughs> right? And, but it is, re- it is really old school. And I don't actually it begrudge is. it for that at all. I agree. It feels like a, ps2 era game but in a really fun way like uh it's there's something very delightful about it it does not take itself that seriously just it's got that that fun playfulness and that sci-fi edge that i love it's the whole stargate kind of thing right where you get the uh the 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 humans landing on this like in this alternate universe and doing their business and the plot actually it is actually funny like there's a lot of parallels with avatar the film right. but all this plot stuff existed for outcast 2 back in like 2001 so like 
the plot that they're telling here is what they were trying to tell on PlayStation 2 and all the old design documents bear that out. So it's kind of funny how I've seen comparisons to Avatar, but it's like, well, these guys are kind of doing it, doing that thing first. So Absolutely. totally interesting. The one thing to take away though, is we're talking about the performance. It did make me chuckle a little bit because the original outcast for it was, it was basically known for running horribly at the time yeah. <laughs> because they were doing stuff. They were trying to do stuff without 3d acceleration support, uh, but supporting features that you would typically expect from 3d acceleration along with that crazy height map terrain system and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And on PCs, I, I played it on my Pentium three PC, which would have been like ultra high end for when this came out. And it was mostly like a 20 FPS experience, like 20 to 25, uh, at 512 by 384 resolution in letterboxed mode. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, a mid-spec PC in 1999, you would have been like 15 FPS at like 320 by 240. <laughs> Oliver, I guess you've not really had too much experience of this game. No, I've not looked at it. The- but it, it does always uh, get the heart racing and makes me very nervous. When I start up a new game and there's some form of tearing that's not tracking with our tools, yeah. and then it's like, oh, jeez, I know. Gonna, it's just like you have to is, go deep. This is a headache. I, where do I crop? Do I set the noise to this and all this? And it's just a, it's it, a huge. Pain. Oliver, I will. As a fun aside, you, you missed some of the old days of DF tearing. Sure, that was tests. worse. <laughs> software was a lot worse. I yeah. would say, although it was yeah. more, it was it was somehow more flexible. Like you could do more stuff manually with FPS GUI, but it didn't track tears all that well for a while. And when I did that 2014 shadow warrior analysis, uh, the video, I spent an entire day, like eight hours manually entering tear lines one by one by clicking them in because I couldn't get it to track. It was a, it was tell, I'll tell you, man, you did not miss that. Yeah. I, you, (laughs) I would just like to say to any developers who might be listening, Please don't include tearing in your games, especially if you're tearing at high frame rates, because then it's just like, oh, oh gosh, geez, it just becomes like, yeah, how do the, I do the this? calculations get a bit tenuous and difficult at that what? point. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. there something weird with Gran Turismo 6 where the tear lines drew at the bottom of the screen? Like they did like a reverse. There's been image? a couple of uh, situations where that has happened and it's it's just kind of weird. So, I think yes. in GT6's case, they did it because if you were racing in cockpit view, all the tearing would occur only in the cockpit area of the screen, right. so you actually wouldn't notice it. Yeah. There's also so Baldur's like the 3D- Gate 3 also does tearing in the bottom of the screen. Oh. So it's just a... Oh, okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> not yeah, we, all, we all hate screen tearing, <laughs> don't we, gents? Well, it's also just yeah. not a good... Ex- I don't think it's a good experience for the player, but it's definitely not a good experience no, for the reviewer trying to analyze this stuff. I, I would say whatever ad- additional input latency you like gains you get out of disabling V-Sync on a console, it's not worth it. It just ruins the image integrity. It looks terrible. Okay. Um, I think that's all we've got to say about Outcast. Really interesting game. Check out the uh, video that John did on it because the history is, is just fascinating. Um, they developed, dare I say it, bespoke technology and they couldn't produce Outcast 2 on the PlayStation 2, but they did produce games on PlayStation 2 that used that technology. Oh, yeah. And I think one of the takeaways from your video, John, was just how good those games looked from the PS2. Yeah, there was like super low budget little extreme sports games they were doing yeah. some crazy stuff like that water rafting game where it's like all this uh weird kind of physics physics driven water system that actually still looks good where it really looks like water rushing down the mountainside and yeah. it reacts to the player and there's a, there's a lot going on there where you're just like huh and they did that at full frame rate too like 60 yeah. fps or 50 Amazing. depending on whether it's power and tsc mm-hmm. good stuff um But with that, let's move on to our final news topic. Okay, John, this isn't really a news topic as such, but um, you wanted to get a shout out, as it were, for Euphoria 2, which you've put down on the sheet as being another 120 FPS banger. Uh, But more to the point, it kind of uh, dovetails slash segues into a DF Retro project that you're working on now. That's right. DF Retro is coming back with a big episode. Uh, so yeah, Hebereke 2 slash Euphoria 2 came out recently. It is the first internally developed, well, I guess there was the Iki reboot thing, but it's the first like proper full 
internal Sunsoft game that these guys have done since they've revived themselves. Because if you, you know, Sunsoft, as they were a powerhouse in the 80s and some of the 90s, and they, they did a lot of stuff. They were especially known for the Batman games, of course, and other licensed properties, as well as just absolutely killer music and tech. Uh, but eventually they just kind of faded away. But the company itself, the Sun Electronics Corporation, or Sun Denshi, they never actually closed. Like, because this games were not their only business. They continued to do business. But in recent years, they reopened development. Uh, and this is the, this is the game that they created there. And when I visited the HQ, I filmed a bunch of, uh, awesome footage. So the DF Retro episode I'm making is basically like a look at Sunsoft's history where I'm walking from the very beginnings of Sunsoft in 1978 up until now to show like all the different periods, like the way they changed and shifted with the market, both the good and the bad, because there is a mix of both. Uh, and then eventually we get up to Hebereke 2, which is mm -hmm. an awesome little platform game uh, with a beautiful style that's sort of like a felt, uh, it's like almost like Kirby's epic yarn, but like less like string based i guess i don't know it's hard to describe they they use these little like those little plastic perler beads to do the text boxes which i also love they do like little pixel art renditions of the characters with perler beads which looks really cool but mm -hmm. yeah it's a it's a it is a sequel to the original hippereke for famicom uh which also <laughs> got a european release called euphoria the saga where they changed all the characters to look super weird and they changed the main character to be called Bop Louie for some reason. Bop As Louie does do? not return. Okay. It's it's just they, they actually have the original Japanese characters. But so what I Western like about name, sorry, the Western name is Euphoria the Saga 2, right? Yeah, or Euphoria 2, the Saga, or something like that. Yeah. Which that's the only thing they kept, thankfully. Not none of the other localization changes. Right. <laughs> uh but the thing I wanted to point out about this game that's pertinent to df is that it's one of the recent games that i've played where on the the newer consoles they just like 120 fps let's do it and that's what they did so okay. th that version those versions all run at 120 frames per second which is something i want to talk about when it when it comes up because i think it's such an important feature especially for a 2d platformer game like it just makes it look so smooth and clean we saw it with ori and the will of the wisps obviously uh that was a great example of it penny's big breakaway also 120 fps and uh, this as well 4k native 120 frames per second buttery buttery smooth uh if you like this sort of famicom era sunsoft stuff i do recommend checking it out but yeah, hopefully in this Sunsoft video, I can sort of walk everybody through the ups and downs of Sunsoft and maybe gain a deeper appreciation for what the game actually is and why it exists. Because, you know, again, this never came out in the US, the original. So it's, there's not going to be that nostalgia there. So it's something that's going to take a little bit of context to understand, I think, which, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's tricky these days, but I do think it's worth checking out. But you actually visited Sunsoft in Japan for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So not specifically, I, I at the time I wasn't sure what I would do with it. But yeah, I went to Sunsoft's office in Japan, uh, the original building where Sunsoft made those games, and I was you know spending time in the office, the very office where all this stuff happened. Uh, they opened up their archive for me. I got all these cool flyers from them. Uh, lot, talked to lots of really cool people there. And just got, got a real sense of appreciation for their history, which I really enjoyed. Um, and that's so there's there's a lot of B-roll and stuff and film footage and some stuff that we show that's never really been shown, at least not in any sort of detail. So there, there will be some cool stuff in there, including an arcade board that never actually got released and only one exists that we hooked up and played on. And Sounds I got to film a little bit of that. Well, they were in the middle of trying to dump it, actually. Right. So they had they had it out at the time for that purpose, and it was like, oh yeah, we're we're working on this. Check it out, which was cool. Oh, any thoughts, Oliver? Anything to add? I think it looks really cool. It reminds me of uh, Yoshi's Crafted World, sort of. And That's it. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, just in terms of the way that they're trying to play with textures and shapes and the felts and the little pin things that John mentioned. I think it looks really cool and uh, just looks like a nice little platformer that seems pretty breezy, would you say, John? Yeah, it's quite breezy. It's it's you know it's funny, comical. It's got absolutely killer music as well. And yeah, yeah hundred twenty like cool FPS, man. It's just it's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Of course, okay. it runs like a dream in the Steam Deck as well, as you'd expect. <laughs> uh, so it's it's good on there. Switch version is the only one that's a little iffy. That is sixty FPS, but it does have dips. So could be better, could be worse. It's not bad on Switch necessarily. It's okay. It's just I'd much rather play any of the other versions so you get that really high frame rate. Okay, fair enough. And that's it. That's the end of our news topics this week. And uh, now we're going to move on to support a Q&A, which is, as always, the part of the show where every week on our Patreon, we ask our supporters to basically ask any questions they like. <laughs> uh, we choose the best or other the ones we're best equipped to answer. And uh, yeah, we basically put them on the show. And others which uh, we think are pretty cool, but we don't have time for, we put them aside for a supporter-only show called DF Indirect, uh, which seems to have gone down nicely. And maybe they'll appear on DF Clips at some point in the future. Uh, but let's get on with this initial question from Gatti. Which is better, Switch cartridge or Blu-ray discs for long-term preservation? John? Uh well, for long-term ownership. So this is, I think I actually have to go with Blu-ray disc for this really? one. Really? Because I'd have said the opposite, but I ahead. agree, but I, I don't yet know what's going to happen here, but there is this concern that's been raised that the switch cartridges use a type of flash memory, right? Right. For storage. Unlike a mask ROM cartridge, like old Super NES, Mega Drive, whatever games where it's, those are virtually indestructible. Uh, they will just continue to operate and with minimal maintenance required. And that's great. But these flashcards, they need an occasional bit of electricity applied to them. And there is this fear that if they sit dormant long enough, uh, they will actually begin to degrade and bits of the data can be uh, lost. And there's all, but there's also some kind of like self repair thing that I saw in terms of the, there's still a lot of can, I don't know all the details on this off the top of my head, but there's definitely some weirdness to it. And I think some people saw this kind of issue with certain 3DS games, possibly, or some early 3DS games have started to exhibit issues okay. that also uses flash ROM like this. Um, so. But I don't think we've actually seen any Switch games necessarily fail yet, per se. There's just that concern is of because of this volatile memory they're using that eventually it may actually degrade and be lost, which is not great news <laughs> for folks like myself. Mm. Whereas the blue, you know, discs I feel are actually quite durable and long lasting. Uh, in the early days, there there was issues with the disc rot to some degree. I've never personally encountered it, uh, but that was usually like a manufacturing defect. I think Blu-ray discs themselves are quite robust, and I, I don't think I've ever heard of anything suffering, a Blu-ray disc, even from the early days, suffering from that. I have, I'm skeptical that it would be an issue on there at all. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they're just really nice. I mean, as long as you take care of them, of course, don't throw it around like a Frisbee, like an old AOL disc that you got in the mail. That's not good. But I think for all intents and purposes, Blu-ray discs should be pretty bulletproof for uh, our lifetimes. Now, in terms of actual, like, quote unquote, preservation, that's a different topic entirely. And I wouldn't rely, you know, I love physical media, but that's not really the way to preserve this stuff, even though... You know, technically, if you're storing something in the cloud, it's still being stored on a physical drive somewhere. It's just a matter, matter of breaking it up and storing it across multiple uh, places. Just It's data redundancy, basically. So, okay. uh, which thankfully the switch has been cracked wide open. So, uh, obviously, we don't want games pirated, but pirates have kind of kept the door open and so much that the switch library is not really at risk of being lost in the future which mm -hmm. is good any thoughts on this one oliver yeah i think because of the nature of flash roms they do tend to sometimes lose charge and degrade over time i've definitely seen seen some worries about that that was actually recently a big problem with uh, wii u consoles potentially 
that are starting to oh yeah that are starting to actually lose some some memory there and it's it's not entirely the same problem but it's a similar problem and are beginning to so that was to, solved yeah yeah but but it was a was a problem right um yeah and assuming they're kept in perfect conditions i think blu-rays as well as other disc media but i think especially blu-rays can last like a long time like i saw someone say that it could be yeah. 50 years or 100 years or something but if they're kept in very good conditions right in the ravages right. of constant right use humidity changes things like that i think both you could probably say they last at least 10 or 15 years with reasonable use but I would I would put my money on the Blu-rays lasting longer in archival conditions for sure. I would have a lot more confidence mm -hmm. in that product. Yeah. I will say uh, I still have I have a bunch of PC Engine CD-ROM games that came out in like 1989. So right. and, and every single one that I have, I literally every disc I have, I've I've gone through and tested them carefully, and and some of those really old ones I've actually run them through on the PC to sort of check for for data issues and they've all come out clean so it's cool to see that those still work i feel like the riskiest discs are still laser discs due to their size and the way they were often manufactured depending on where they were manufactured those do seem to fail more often than any other disc type but okay. which is a shame because laser discs are awesome <laughs> i mean going into this one i would have suspected that the switch cartridge would be more durable but it is sort of related to this concept of uh, what do they call it disc what that yep. there is something inherent to uh, uh, disc based media that means that it's not as durable um, over the course of time but you know thinking about it your PC engine example is a better one than I was going to come up with which is you know this is uh, enemy territory quake wars on Xbox 360 which I bought because we want to do a retro time capsule on on, on, on this game and you know this disc is 17 years old I mean it looks perfect it runs perfect but you can actually go back further to like PS1 games PS2 games and your extreme example the PC engine <laughs> yeah, which was like the first games ever shipped I think on CD-ROM yeah. was on the PC I think engine. maybe there's a lot of the perception may have come from like DIY burned discs Oh yeah, those are less likely to survive. And also, there there were some factories back then that made some errors with uh, applying the layers that I think could result in disc rot. So it's more yeah. like a manufacturing defect that comes to light in time. Yeah, I do remember back in the day when you were burning your own DVDs, there were like uh, you could buy sort of top end verbatim media, which was sort of seen as the best of the best. But then there was this whole bunch of uh, what you might call cowboy outfits producing their own dvdrs which you know they might not have even burned correctly in the first place let alone be durable across the years i actually found an old dvd r recently where i had burned the movie cash Earn on it back in the day i remember being curious about it as a japanese film and i popped it into my player back there and it started right up <laughs> so it's still good it's like 20 years old i think at this point Okay, uh, good stuff. Uh, let's move on to our next question. This one from Steel from Work. VGC is reporting that some third-party publishers are considering dropping Xbox support due to quote-unquote flatlining performance in Europe with claims that producing a Series S and X version of a game isn't worth the effort. What do you make of this? Is Series S really that much of a pain to develop for? With development costs increasing, you would think publishers would want to release on more platforms, not fewer uh, Oliver, thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think the size of the market is just smaller, and it's not helpful that it's more complicated to develop for. And it's also not helpful that there are, you know, two units out in the market right now. One of them is significantly compromised. The Series S, from from all that I've heard, is a really challenging system to work with for some, especially higher end games. I also think that yeah. Xbox customers are used to Game Pass, and they're used to the free models in a way that PlayStation customers maybe aren't, and, and that does condition them to spend less money on discrete games. I think ultimately the question would be, on, a, on the financial side, what percentage of you know, your audience is on Xbox? Is it 25%? Is it 15%? Is it 10%? And then also the size of your project, right? Like if you're looking at a big, heavy-hitting game like Call of Duty, you know, of course, it's going to be worth it to ship that on everything because the margins are, you know, the amount of volume you're getting is so huge. But for an indie game, like what we're seeing recently with some uh, developers that are choosing not to publish on Xbox, they have a fairly small market of players anyways. 
and maybe those players already own a PlayStation or a PC that could play it, and maybe it's just not worthwhile for them to ship a smaller game on an Xbox platform with all the additional costs that would incur. So I think it's a question of just the market economics of what makes sense there. And I think, unfortunately, those don't favor a console manufacturer with a smaller place in the market where, you know, 90% or 80% of the sales from what I've seen might be on other platforms. It just doesn't favor you in that position. Mm. John? Yeah, that's a... Man, this is, it's a real tricky one. And it's hard to really speak without seeing the numbers directly, right? But obviously, developers do have to make these choices. And I think it's just going to depend on the the potential size of what the game is. Like, I think for big games, it still makes sense to absolutely ship on Xbox. But for smaller indie stuff, smaller games, that then the, I think the question rises a lot. If you don't have like a Game Pass deal lined up, I feel like the amount of work required to get it up on Xbox may not be worth it if the sales are too low. And I've, I mean, I, I have all, I have heard stories of indie games that have sold like literally in like the dozens of units on Xbox, like very low numbers where you're just like, oh, I probably shouldn't have bothered doing that. But uh, I think that's just like an indie thing. Whereas for like larger games, it's, I think it still makes sense, right? Like, there's, there's still a big audience there. It's not like the system has a tiny audience to address. There's still millions and millions of these things out there. I mean, games were still being made for the GameCube when that was like under 10 million compared right. to like the juggernaut that was PS2, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not nearly that kind of situation here. The Xbox, it's still, I mean, I'd still say the series has largely been a success, right? Like a moderate success. Um, it's difficult to tell at this point. There's so many negative headlines coming out about sure. flatlining hardware sales. But it, when you look at the Xbox platform more holistically, it's it's really difficult to say uh, because obviously we're in a kind of transition point in terms of business models. I mean, it often gets uh, sort of mooted that the Xbox ecosystem has more active players than it ever has. Um, but that's because obviously... A lot of it is um, going to be uh, Game Pass PC, possibly. So it's really difficult to sort of put a yardstick on success. Certainly on the console side, though, that which which kind of leads directly into this question. Yeah, I thought that the concept of the GDK, uh, which basically would in theory harmonise PC development across, sorry, game development across PC and consoles, would have helped a bit there. And certainly on the indie side of things it shouldn't be pushing the platform that hard. Um, so it should run on Series S. But that, with that said, you know, we have heard a lot of um, stories about cutbacks that were required to a game to get it to run on Series S. Um, it's hard to think of any game, though, that where you can actually see... I mean, it's typically the loss of a performance mode or ray tracing features uh, that, that, that seems to have been the, the sort of issue with making it work on on series s i don't know you know is it is series s really that much of a pain to develop for as steel from work says uh, or asks rather it's those big games that you know have been challenging and some developers have been on the record to say that it has been challenging like uh, remedy with alan wake 2 but even there the actual final product was actually really good <laughs> i thought for this, bearing in mind the specification of the machine and you know if we were sort of heading to this future where everything is basically coming off a PC development, um, you'd hope that in the fullness of time, if they're targeting, you know, a handheld upwards, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. I don't know. It's, it's, it's difficult. We just don't have the figures. Uh, but I can certainly see the concept of Game Pass having an influence on uh, smaller games. Um, but again, it's kind of all hearsay at the moment. I'd like to see somebody actually come forward and say, this is what's happening on Xbox for us, and this is what we'd like to see change. But it's kind of conjecture at the moment. It's just kind of like rumblings, so to speak. 
Uh, let's move on to this question then from Techno Dan. Uh, why do you think Sony decided to go for a significant GPU upgrade for only a modest CPU upgrade in PS5 Pro, given that it seems to be the CPU that's stopping many newer and future titles from running at 60 FPS on the base console, which I would imagine a lot of quote unquote pro gamers are looking for, and that the new PlayStation machine learning upscaling will likely help to increase resolutions anyway? Uh, John? It's probably the best they could do given the current hardware landscape and what, what AMD is doing, right? Like, I, th I feel like massively upgrading the CPU would have been more difficult given what we know there. And also, I, I, I don't think frame rate alone is the issue. I mean, I, th I think the bigger problem, I think image quality has become a huge problem this generation with a lot of GPU limited scenarios. The fact that we've seen so many games dipping down to like 720p, I or think lower. that or lower, that kind of took me by surprise. I have to admit, I didn't think we'd be seeing resolutions that low. So uh, I think that that kind of explains some of the logic there and just wanting to get into machine learning. I don't know, based on, <laughs> it's tricky. You're right, we have seen issues, but I think we're always, you'll always see games that don't run as well as you'd like, no matter what the hardware is, right? Yeah. 60 frames per second remains a design choice. If you want to do 60, you can build the game around 60. And it's just not everyone is necessarily capable or willing to make the cuts necessary to reach that point. And I think just upgrading a CPU alone isn't going to suddenly magically solve that. The CPUs this gen are dramatically better than what we had last gen, and it's already becoming an issue again. And yeah. honestly, a lot of developers I've spoken with, I said this last time, was like they were they're genuinely okay with the CPU performance on these new machines. It's just about what you do with it. Right. And I, I think there is some problems with like, if you're, if you're doing unreal engine game and you're not managing the CPU stuff, well, you can end up in that situation where you're heavily single threaded. And then even then you also see problems on PCs, which is not good. So it's not just that the consoles need more powerful CPUs is that developers really need to think a little bit more carefully about how they're using their CPU resources because it also matters for PC gamers. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thoughts, Oliver? Yeah, and we're seeing that with titles like Dragon's Dogma 2 or Baldur's Gate 3 that are yeah, demanding geez. they're demanding everywhere. They're not just demanding on console. They're demanding yeah, on yeah, yeah. you know a 7800X 3D. There's no liberation <laughs> from the perils of, yeah. of CPU-bound performance. Um, personally, I... Apart from frame gen. Uh, well, yeah, frame, frame gen. Yeah. That's it. Go to 30 FPS and frame gen to 60. Maybe that's the the path we're all <laughs> we're all headed towards. But um, I think Ugh. probably a big part of it is going to be compatibility and simplicity reasons for developers. Because when you look at Zen 4, you've got like an eight core CCX. You've got a different cache hierarchy with more L2, more L3. It's you know it, it's it involves different optimizations to run code well on that on that platform. That takes more work, and I imagine Sony just didn't want the additional complication for developers in that end. And then there's also the question of area efficiency, right? Zen 2 is is a smaller design than Zen 3, than Zen 4. That's also very important. Uh, there, there's also some question about like what IP works. So Zen 4, I don't know if Zen 4 is on a 7 nanometer or 6 nanometer class pro process that, that, that I think is on 5, so it would take work to port it to 6, assuming the PS5 Pro is on 6. Zen 3 would potentially work in that scenario, but Zen 3 isn't as much of an uplift. And of course, you have the area questions and then the questions of developer optimization. And it just becomes, I think, much simpler and much easier and much more cost efficient to say, we're going to go with the design that you guys have been using for five years, developing your games <laughs> instead of a new design. That's just my my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, a console is always a fixed, you know, it's a, it's a fixed platform and it's, you know, its capabilities are kind of hailing from when it was designed, right? And uh, that basically, that means that from a development perspective, it's exactly as John says, games typically target 60 FPS or target 30 FPS because those are the, you know, the dividing factors on a 60 hertz and indeed 120 hertz display. Um, so, you know, if you want a more complex game, you're going to run at a lower frame rate. It's, it's that simple. Um, there is obviously optimization over time, which, you know, you, you can see some amazing stuff being done on the base PS4. Um, you know, years after it was actually designed. But the point is that, you know, it's it's a fixed console. And if you're going to produce an offshoot of that, it kind of makes sense to make it as developer friendly as possible. And 
you're not going to double CPU performance on an enhanced console that's produced a few years later. It's just not really going to happen. So where can you double performance? Well, GPUs are inherently more parallel. You can add extra CUs and automatically gain extra performance. Um, obviously, it does look as though Sony has come up against the limit of the manufacturing processes enabling uh, enabling fewer CUs to be added relatively compared to PS4 Pro. So they've gone for a machine learning upscaling route. The other thing to bear in mind here is, yes, we've seen a lot of CPU limited games, but um, it, as, again, if it's a given that it takes four years to develop a console, Sony wouldn't have had that insight when they first started the design um, or even when they finished the design. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of the way it is. I'm trying to think of, you know, going back to, say, 2020, it just finished PS5. They're moving on to PS5 Pro. Possibly when they saw the original Unreal Engine 5 demos from that time period, there might have been an inkling that there was, you know, an, uh, potentially an issue with CPU at that point because those early demos were really CPU heavy, certainly on the PC side of things. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's basically what can be done with a set budget, you know, and it is easier to scale up GPU than it is to uh, to scale up the CPU in a meaningful way, that is. So I think that's basically the reason why they did that. And it's, you know, the same sort of arguments were heard with PS4 Pro, right? You know, why aren't they moving on to Zen? Zen 1 at the time. And um, yeah, that probably was a more compelling argument. And the response back then from Mark Cerny was, well, it's about compatibility. Um, and, and that's kind of that, really. Compatibility, the area cost, as Oliver says. Um, you know, if you're doubling your transistors or whatever, you want double the performance. And if you're not getting that, you're kind of like wondering whether it's worth it. So there's a lot of uh, sort of contributing factors to why the PS5 Pro CPU seemingly is what it is. Um, so let's move on to the next question. This one from Andre Serlis. Uh, Microsoft's quote unquote power of the cloud seems more possible than ever in their upcoming quote unquote most powerful console ever. How do you see them best levering, leveraging that technology? GeForce now can run, run on an app. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to you on this one, Oliver, since you're fully into AI <laughs> and by extension, the cloud. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, what do you think about this? The pitch, if you go back to that May 2022 document for the next gen Xbox console was like cohesive cloud compute or hybrid cloud compute, which implies yeah. that you're not necessarily running everything in the cloud, but you're using a mixture of local hardware and cloud hardware to accelerate certain workloads, use a mixture of hardware as, as appropriate which I think takes a lot of the kind of traditional cloud gaming scenarios that you would have seen Google pitch with Google Stadia, like doing, you know, instant game trials or various real-time spectator modes or various Twitch integrations, things like this. That makes that less possible, although I have to imagine that they probably will have an Xbox console a platform in the in the cloud exclusively with, the, with those consoles as well. But I tend to think that a lot of that pitch does involve things that are AI related, that are very memory heavy and latency insensitive. So stuff like AI dialogue generation, voice synthesis, AI driven asset work, stuff like that, that could be uh, applied in real time um, or, or in semi real time, but doesn't need to be generated like within uh, 30 milliseconds, <laughs> you know, it can take a little bit longer. So that would be my suspicion. And the nature of a lot of AI workloads at the moment um, is that they tend to be very memory hungry which a console is obviously not going to have a ton of. So for those memory heavy operations, you would really want to rely on the cloud. Maybe you could run some stuff locally that's a little bit leaner, but but for memory heavy stuff, you would want to rely on the cloud. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, don't really have much to add to that. It's, I When I talk, you, you know, it's not my favorite subject. <laughs> I think what's being discussed here isn't the concept of no, like, know, GeForce Now. It's more the idea of uh, combining local and cloud compute to produce something genuinely different. Uh, and I think the I, issue there is, uh, from my perspective, I don't see how this strategy can merge with the handheld strategy that they're talking about. Because the whole point of a handheld is that you know, it's mobile, you take it with you. You're not going to be connecting uh, your handheld Xbox to the cloud, 
you know, via your phone or whatever, it's unlikely to have a 5G modem. And even if it did, what's the chances that you could actually get reliable right. connection to the cloud? They so wouldn't be this... stupid enough to release a PlayStation Portal equivalent. <laughs> well, you oh, know, it's, it's, it's different, right? It's, the, I think what's being talked about here is the, the concept of uh, remote compute being, you know, augmenting yeah. your local compute to produce this <sighs> glorious thing. That, that was the pitch that was made for Xbox One. You know, it was kind of like, I think it was a reaction to the fact that the PlayStation 4 had much better GPU at the time. It's like, hey, well, hold on a second. We've got all this amazing stuff happening in the cloud. And that seems to be a sort of redux of that. But we are in a rather exciting AI age. I just don't see how you can have, on the one hand, a handheld machine that's designed to be used, you know, anywhere. And then, you know, this concept of this uh, homogenous compute entity that's working both locally and in the cloud to produce this brand new generation of games. There's still that bit of an issue there. So uh, in terms of how that technology is going to be leveraged, I don't, I don't know. I, I just I mean, can't see it working on a handheld unless you're at home with a high bandwidth connection. I think realistically, it can. It's something that can work for specific game concepts. This is not like a large scale thing that you're going to be using across everything. I think that doesn't right. make much sense. Mm -hmm. But I think there are game concepts p potentially. It's been tough to actually figure that out. Where perhaps they could leverage this. You know, it's it's no big deal to have uh, an MMO or like a game like Diablo or something that's always online now, even though yeah. maybe Diablo shouldn't be. But Or, or you know, they, something like Helldivers. It's, it's they, maybe exactly. unlikely like, to be taking out. It would just remotely. be a case of like, okay, this is an online game uh, and we're using the cloud for something. Whether that's compelling enough to the audience, that's, that's still kind of up in the air, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they need to find a compelling use case for it to make it actually worth doing. And I don't think we've actually seen any shipping products really do that. No. Yeah. So I also think that just kind of thinking about all the things we've discussed today <laughs> and bring it all together. I think we do have some conflicts here, right? We have the handheld yep. in one corner, which is a low power console uh, that presumably is going to be the baseline for a lot of these titles. Then we have Microsoft saying, we're going to do the most powerful console ever, which sounds like maybe at this point <laughs> is just a reskinned PC of some variety. Right, that's their next gen system. And then we also, going back to May of 2022, we have this cohesive cloud compute console that it could be ARM, it could be x86, it could be a lot of things. It's very custom, it's a more traditional console design. So I would suggest that the more plausible thing is that this cohesive cloud compute hybrid console has been abandoned at some stage. And now the focus is on this new handheld, the focus is on bringing Xbox and Windows together in some sense and making that vision work potentially with a very wide range of scaling maybe keeping similar cpus but very wide range of scaling on the gpu between those different systems i think that looks like a more plausible route forward than this cohesive cloud compute thing because you're right rich it just does not work at all with this uh nope. with this handheld concept right it just does not work right I mean, it could. I think it may well be the case that it could be deployed on certain games that yeah. are reliant on a network connection. That kind of makes sense, but it's not going to be, you know, as was kind of hinted back in the day that, okay, your graphics are suddenly going to get a lot better because you've got this compute that's available remotely. <laughs> uh, the, the counterpoint I would say is that um, the amount of money that Microsoft is investing now in AI compute. There's going to be somebody at Microsoft saying, why aren't we using this for gaming? What could it do? You know, it could be a game changer and it possibly could. So there is that sort of, you know, which is maybe one of the reasons why we had the whole power of the cloud concept thrust upon us back oh. in the day, even though it never actually led to Yeah, when, when Mr. Businessman is like, let's use, the, let's leverage this thing to make games rather than the game developers. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's problematic. Um, Let's move on to the next question. This one from I underscore uh, like underscore licorice. And me too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, DFers, exclamation point. I find Nintendo's output on Switch excellent, both in quality, volume, and diversity. However, with constant news on how game development is getting more expensive, I'm worried that Switch 2 will receive less games and Nintendo might avoid experiments. Is my worry justifiable? Tools are also progressing 
So could Nintendo keep up the production of software at the current level because Switch 2 will be a quote unquote generation behind? Uh, Oliver? I am worried about that as well. I am significantly worried about that. And I think Nintendo's output has been slowing as of late. And I think that they probably will slow down in this upcoming generation. But I think Nintendo is in a good position maybe with respect to some of the other console uh, platform holders, because they do have this tendency of combining double A and triple A games and pitching that to their audience. And the audience tends to be more receptive, right? Like the typical yeah. Nintendo title is not receiving the same $200 million budget that would be often kind of a prerequisite to pitch a game on another console platform. And you have titles like Princess Peach Showtime or like Luigi's Mansion 2, uh, the, the the remake, the, the re revitalization of that title, um, that are getting mixed in with titles like Metroid Prime 4 and Tears of the Kingdom, which are these bigger budget titles, and the audience seems fairly receptive to that. So I think they're in a position where they can take these concepts and make them work within a lower budget. Maybe the less powerful hardware helps them do that as well. And I think that's a position where they're going to have a relative advantage, but I still think that they will not be delivering games at quite the same pace that we're used to in the next generation. That's my suspicion, unfortunately. Right. Interesting. John? Oh, I'm not sure it would necessarily affect them too much because uh, I think the thing about Nintendo is the, the types of art style that they embrace, the types of games they make, will look amazing on this new hardware just due to the nature of using a more powerful device. Yeah. That's one of the reasons the emulators have been so popular for Switch games. I don't think they need to massively overhaul what they're doing on the visual side. I think it, they would just naturally benefit from higher resolutions, better image quality, and uh, even more consistent performance. You think you take Tears of the Kingdom, you run it at equivalent of like a DLSS 4K60. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with those visuals. Those look amazing. And whatever changes they could make to make them look a little bit better, I don't think would massively impact the budget necessarily. Like, I feel like they're still going to be targeting a similar level of visual fidelity on the new machine, and they don't really need to go that much higher than what they've done already. It'll just, they can just run it better. Uh, and they can maybe execute slightly more complex concepts with fewer issues. Uh, so I, and it's not like they make, they don't really make the types of games that have become, that have been exploding in terms of uh, cost as well. Because, like, one of the most expensive things in a lot of these games really is making these, like, it's either, so open world stuff is expensive, yes, so Zelda is going to be more expensive and take time, but I don't think that's going to change much. Uh, but then stuff like cutscenes and all the cinematic stuff, that stuff's really expensive to make. It takes a long time. Or the games that rely on service services and are, like, massively multiplayer, that stuff also takes a lot of resources to run. Those last two, though, are not really things that Nintendo does all that much. The, and they right. don't need to. So I think that just by that virtue, that they should be okay. Mm -hmm. I think their their biggest growing pains was moving to the modern style of graphics rendering with what they did with the Wii U jump. Uh, but I think this new Switch can just be a continuation of what they've always done and what they've been doing on Switch, just with uh, with fewer issues. <laughs> right. I mean, if we'd go back to I Like Liquish's point in terms of quality, volume, and diversity... Um, I do think there are some worries here because Switch 2 isn't going to be able to rely on an entire last generation of titles that could be ported across in the way that happened with Switch 1. We got that quality, volume and diversity, I think, partly because between sort of like the brand new Switch games, you had an entire generation's worth of really excellent Wii U titles that never really found an audience. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that definitely contributed to quality, volume and diversity because there was never any issue uh, with the quality and diversity of Wii U titles. It was just there weren't enough consoles out there to justify making them. And suddenly there was with the Switch. And um, so I'm kind of interested to see how the, uh, the volume specifically is going to pan out on Switch 2. Um, Switch really was... Uh, or, you know, genius on the part of Nintendo for, for a number of reasons. Obviously, they could have a really rich uh, first party lineup, two generations worth of development, really, could be deployed. Um, and then it sort of doubled up again because the mobile and the um, home console divisions essentially merged 
to create games for a single platform. Um, so, yeah, and then, of course, you had all of the third party stuff because, um, you know, the hardware was third party friendly. It was, you know, essentially an underpowered, you might argue, but still a modern uh, console architecture. So it was kind of like um, one might say, you know, a once in a lifetime coming together of all of this stuff that created that quality, volume and diversity. I'm going to be interested to see how it happens on Switch 2, but I do foresee that there'll be fewer titles, you know, possibly augmented with uh, Switch 2 upgrades for the uh, Switch 1 games, of course, uh, which which Switch 2 would definitely enable. Um, interested to see how that, that one works out. But I do think that John's hit the nail on the head in other regards, which is that um, the nature of the, the games Nintendo make isn't really sort of married to this kind of uh, quest for absolute fidelity that a lot of uh, game developers have uh, sort of embraced in the last couple of generations specifically. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, interesting to see what happens. Let's move on to our final question for the show. And this one's from um, perfect underscore organism. Um, interesting question, this one. I love the feature set that NVIDIA offers with their GPUs. And to be honest, I secretly love the idea of NVIDIA GPUs in the consoles. But I'm becoming concerned about a bit of a monopoly brewing. Uh, Team Green feels so far ahead that catching up with them feels like a bit of a mammoth task. And that feels like it brings some existential questions to a truly quote unquote free market. Could any company ever have the capital to catch up to NVIDIA at this point? I struggle to balance the moral compass in my head over wanting the quote unquote best product versus wanting a quote unquote healthy market. Whilst acknowledging the feature set um, on NVIDIA GPUs is super compelling, it is perhaps a good thing they're not in consoles to perhaps allow for a semblance of a competitive market in the GPU space. Oliver, it's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I think slash hope slash sort of believe that AMD <laughs> will get there on the machine learning stuff on, on the hardware and they will figure out a solution that works for them. I have to imagine it's, it's got to happen, right? It's really got to happen. Yeah. And then it's just a question at that point, once you have performant hardware or performant enough hardware, right? Doesn't need to be in the same, doesn't need to be within the same, you know, 10%, 20% of NVIDIA, but as long as it's in the same zip code, you can do something with it. And then it's just a question of getting the right solutions in the software. And we've seen, uh, cross vendor solutions like XCSS already work pretty decently on AMD cards, more recent AMD cards. So it really is just a question, I think, at that point of getting the software solutions. And obviously, NVIDIA is enormously ahead in the software solutions with uh, DLSS 3.5 rake reconstruction. But if you look at like DLSS 2, the more traditional upsampler, upscaler, you have a lot of DLSS 2 competitors at this point, some machine learning based, some that offer pretty comparable quality. So I think that that's totally like again all this stuff is achievable after the hardware power is there or maybe even before the hardware power is there because obviously xcss runs pretty well on uh, some amd gpus i do yeah. think it's legitimate to worry about and i do worry a little bit about amd's market share but amd's market share has almost like has basically always been quite depressed relative to nvidia's so whatever their 15 or 20 percent is at this point um of uh, discrete gpu sales i don't think it's something to worry about inordinately relative to you might you be worried about it in the past <laughs> because that's always been the position and amd obviously has a very healthy console market and they have a healthy data center market as well to feed their their products into so i don't think it's an enormous worry for the health of that company's gpu offerings okay uh john oh not too much to add to that i think all is right but i will say that it does the point about oh man it does create these questions like you don't want to accept a, a lesser pro like a lesser product just like just oh i'm gonna go with this because i want them to be able to compete but then if i don't know man because i also want the best but you're right like having just essentially a monopoly would not be good and it does feel like amd's but i feel like amd has always kind of played second second fiddle to everyone somehow but they've continued to still do well and thrive I mean, I remember the days of Pentium versus all the early that when they introduced the K6, uh, it feels like AMD's always been in this situation where they're just like the underdog and they've very rarely been able to pull out of it. 
and they do seem to rely on these other businesses as well, which NVIDIA does too. But I mean, I, I hope like Oliver says, they can get, they can actually figure out some of their hardware deficiencies and start to compete in this other area as well. Cause that would be mm. good for everyone. It's an interesting contention, but I think that AMD has proven to be competitive uh, in different ways, right? Um, for whatever reason, basically every major console up until the Switch from like, well, essentially uh, Xbox One almost has been AMD based, right? And the reason that they are AMD based is that fundamentally AMD gave them a better deal than NVIDIA. And then, of course, there's the whole, uh, you know, the sort of beef that sort of emerge from prior NVIDIA deals. Oh, yeah. Uh, which has been well documented, you know, the whole thing with the original Xbox and, you know, the, the, the sense that PlayStation 3 GPU was kind of like that NVIDIA had Sony over a barrel because they couldn't go anywhere else for a GPU. And the GPU is probably the worst aspect of the PlayStation 3. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are sort of um, outstanding issues that, that would cause, uh, that, that would require ironing out to make an NVIDIA co uh, console GPU happen outside of the Nintendo arena. There was uh, issues before in the past, I think, that uh, NVIDIA wouldn't um, allow ownership of, of, of an IP I think that was one of the issues with the original Xbox, possibly. Anyway, they couldn't cost-reduce the original Xbox, and that was uh, apparently down to NVIDIA, so that caused issues. AMD steps in with favourable terms, and, you know, to be fair, they've produced some really great GPUs for consoles over the yeah. years. Yeah. What's happening now in recent years is that NVIDIA are actually pushing ahead with new features that are actually redefining what potentially a video game can be, and that's kind of why we're looking at you know stuff like um the concept of an nvidia gpu being in the next xbox if nvidia is dominating pcs so dramatically it makes sense if you're microsoft potentially to align with all of those innovations that just keep on coming it's down to um amd to you know basically fight back really and they've got a great track record of fighting back yeah. um within you know specific scopes I don't think you can argue at this point that Zen has been nothing more than a totally unmitigated success, right? The, the CPU market landscape has completely changed there. Obviously, there was some um, complacency on their rival, which they don't have with NVIDIA. Yeah. But, you know, they are a rich company now. AMD are a very well-funded company. They're doing great things. It's up to them now to step forward to be more competitive. And it'll be interesting to see just whether it is the case that, you know, AMD being the default choice for, for GPUs uh, persists into the next generation because there is, you know, a lot of competition there now. It is, you know, you always want the underdog to do well, right? Yep. And in the in the graphics space, AMD is undoubtedly the, the underdog, certainly in the PC space, but they've held their own in handhelds, they've held their own in consoles, and it's it's down to them basically to come up with something competitive. Um, and, and that's kind of it really. I don't think it's really down to the consumer to be worried about no. this stuff. It's ultimately AMD have got to compete and come up with great products. And, you know, that's the, that's the nature of a free market, right? <laughs> um, I don't have anything more to add to that. I don't know if you guys do. Any Wise final words, thoughts? Rich. That was good. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, well, that was the final question, and therefore the end of the show. So if you did enjoy it, please do like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for things that may or may not appear on your phone or within your browser that may or may not inform you of new Digital Foundry content. Store.digitalfoundry.net to check out our merchandising wares, including our new Digital Foundry approved seal of quality t-shirts, which I'm assured will not cause legal problems with Nintendo. Uh, <laughs> Um, play, plenty of stuff there please do check it out um, but that's all from us for this week I guess we'll see you next week thanks for watching <laughs>